Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, many of the most worthwhile things in life are only received by us after struggling to achieve them. Um, simple example in athletics, the accomplishments that I'm most proud of were things I had to work really hard to achieve. Managing money or spring cleaning can be very satisfying, but it can also be a little challenging to get it done. Tackling a major problem at a workplace or, or finishing a rummage sale and cleaning up afterwards, again, can be uh, a bit of a struggle, but uh, worth it in the end. Well, this month, we're um, looking at Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and we'll see a salvation struggle as well at work. Salvation, we know through Jesus Christ, is, is free. There's forgiveness whenever we fail. There's undeniable joy, but nonetheless, following Jesus is still sometimes a struggle. Many of the things that I consider in my life to be most worthwhile or most valuable were a bit of a struggle to achieve or are continuing to be something that I have to work for, you might say. Raising a decent garden takes some dedication and patience. And, and leading people is a similar sort of thing. And raising a child takes even more dedication and patience. And there's undeniable joy in each journey, and they're all worth it. But before you arrive, there's always struggles. For the next five weeks or so, we'll be focusing on um, 2 Corinthians, and, and the whole book might be labeled Salvation Struggle. Faith is not simply a belief, nor is it for the faint of heart or for those who are too full of themselves. Ever since the fall, ever since Jacob wrestled with God and Jesus wrestled with demons and overcame, faith has been a struggle. And today's reading is emblematic of that concept of salvation struggle. Uh, our reading begins with a picture of a very precious or, or rare item being carried around in very ordinary plain jar of clay. Now, jars of clay were the ancient world's version of cheap plastic. Of course, plastic is is way better from an engineering perspective, but in the pot's favor, at least they were biodegradable. And another advantage of pots for the ancient world was that they don't require a factory. And the main ingredient of clay jars is clay, pretty available and cheap. Well, this picture reflects the irony of the Christian life in which was particularly magnified, Paul said, in his own lives or in the other apostles around him. Uh, the metaphor is pretty simple. The ordinary clay jars are the people, Christians, you and me, and the apostles. Uh, the precious treasure is Jesus, and Paul especially highlights Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, in the New Testament, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus are clearly not simply an event that we believe, although they are that, but they are something much more. They are, that is the core of our new identity in Christ. Now, we don't die in a physical sense yet, just because we're Christians, yet we do die to sin. We're in the process of God killing impure and selfish desires and making you and me new, different than we would be without God in our lives. And in chapter 5, Paul will say more about this. He'll talk about through the Spirit, we are a new creation in Christ. And that means, among other things, that we're no longer dependent upon the praise or pleasures of this world. Instead, we find consolation or satisfaction in our Savior. The Christian faith is always a struggle, a struggle in particular between life and death. And as we continue to read in 2 Corinthians, we'll see that Paul himself, in, in this book in particular, faces, or this city in particular, maybe is a better way to put it, faces a lot of external challenges. Paul had to 
struggle to teach the Corinthians about things like sexual immorality or caring for not just their own needs, but the needs of their faith and fellow Christians. And Paul didn't just struggle in a classroom sort of sense to teach them this. He had to follow through and correct them repeatedly for mistakes in these areas. On top of that, Paul also faced public competition, challengers, and even haters in Corinth. Um, most uh, importantly, though, the church in Corinth is struggling simply to trust in Paul and the gospel message that he brings. There are a lot of questions and challenges circling Paul, with, and the most important was for the people who were in the church or considering the faith, whether they should believe what Paul was telling them, because they were hearing other things, too. Initially, they had been very excited, and that's why they had been baptized and become Christian. But now that the rubber was hitting the road, there were some that were waffling in their commitment. Um, another struggle or related struggle that Paul had is how he is perceived. Paul, if you think about it, and that's what Paul brings up, he doesn't look all that impressive. His list of accomplishments, now his, uh, he's probably got a lot of airline miles racked up and rewards if they had such things back then, but what he's actually done doesn't look that impressive to many people. And when you look at what's happened to him, people are decidedly unimpressed. He's been beat up. He doesn't stay at posh hotels. His salary is pitiful, and he's often, well, in jail. This is all the stuff that his opponents latch onto and detractors take and begin talking about, and they begin a pretty successful smear campaign to discredit Paul in Corinth and beyond. And it's really quite the spectacle. A lot of people see this spectacle and the the things surrounding Paul, and they hear all kinds of hostile and negative thoughts or um, interpretations directed towards Paul and the gospel, and they start to wonder, what did we get ourselves into here? Is this Paul guy a crazed lunatic? Is he just a criminal? Is this new community and lifestyle really worth it? Well, in the light of these struggles, and those who are slipping away from the faith, Paul encourages them not to lose heart, but to hold on. Well, this week we were preparing for our rummage sale, and early in the week, uh, some of our Houston-bound youth helped me carry some stuff from, from the library upstairs down to the gym, a little bit of a, of a journey. And uh, we had to tag team, uh, carry a couple of heavy items, and, and even some of the other items, I could see the kids who were helping me, they were straining, or you could sort of see their fingers slowly losing their grip on what they were doing. But even though it looked like they were about to drop it, thankfully they never did. <laughs> and when I asked them if they needed a break or if we needed to put it down, they always wanted to push through. They just want, they were so close, they just wanted to finish the job. They were almost done and they didn't want to stop halfway through. Well, that's what Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to do. Don't give up. You're almost there. You've, you've already made it through the worst part. The finish line is, is golden, and you're almost there. He paints this picture of, of the goal to where they are going so that they realize that the grind is worth it. He says, this, this pain is nothing. Our light and momentary troubles, our temporary afflictions, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In order to follow Christ, it does take some gumption, some faith and faith strength. And there are days when the struggle in our faith is real. So real, we just want to stop struggling and, and give up. But don't. Don't give up. We aren't just doing this for no reason at all. We have, you have, a purpose, a calling in Christ. And this world can wear us down, but we're striving towards a world that is right and whole in Christ, renewed, remade, fixed, as only God Almighty can fix it. Uh, Paul quotes from the book of Psalms to help, make, help them make sense of their suffering. Uh, Psalm 116 starts, and ends, it starts and ends as a psalm of praise. But in the middle, Paul has some, 
I, I don't know if it's quite a complaint, but it's pretty close. The psalmist cries out, which is the first half is what Paul says, I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. All humanity is liars. Psalm 116 goes on to speak of, not, of God not forgetting about his people, even if they were to die. Well, that's what Paul wants us to remember when we are struggling and suffering and, and thinking of, of giving up. Suffering, first of all, is, is not proof that God does not care. Rather, God is not scared to face suffering, nor does he simply avoid it. Rather, he overcomes it through the cross. And we, too, need not be scared or cowed by suffering. Rather, we face it with Jesus and the cross set before us. For through Christ, we, too, shall overcome and not avoid suffering. Um, people like Abraham, Moses, and David were not, if you think about their stories, were not universally loved or initially even welcomed, often by the very people they spoke to. Rather, they were often persecuted or, and derided. But that, did that stop Moses or David or Abraham? No, because they had the Lord of hosts by their side. Now, in, in most of those cases, they consider giving up, but they are encouraged by the Lord. And through the Lord, they overcame. And so, too, will you and I. Be, don't get thrown off your game by suffering. And, and the reason Psalm 116 worked as a, a song, probably maybe one of the favorite songs of Israel, was because it started and ended with faith, but in the middle was that struggle. It's started with faith, it ended with faith, but in the middle it has these complaints and, and problems that are going on in the world. And that's how often God still works and how he worked with his people in the Old Testament. He starts, he starts them off giving them blessings, and, and he promises many more later. But in the middle, it was a salvation struggle. Well, sometimes our walk with Christ is a salvation struggle as well. But if you think about it, we are, if we are ever in a position like Paul, David, Moses, or challenged physically, emotionally, psychologically on account of our faith, then we are in good company, the company of the saints. More importantly, we are in the company of Jesus Christ, who suffered for doing good and following the will of his Father. Just as Jesus overcame, so too we will be renewed. And so Paul says, we walk by faith. We are outwardly attacked and wasting away, but our souls are renewed day by day by Christ, our Lord and Savior. So don't give up the fight, but continue in the salvation struggle. Christ will sustain you. In Jesus' name, amen.